Hello, and welcome back to Conquerors of Kulchorn. I'm Bert the Bandit. As you can see, my appearance is somewhat different. Since the tournament, last video I fought in another tournament, which gave me enough money to buy some, yeah, some new equipment. This and that. I've also uh, gotten a few troops here and there, not many. But, although I've heard of Kulchorn and decided to come to this land, mostly or just heard of the wealth and stuff. I wasn't really paying attention to many of the stories. And I figured, ah, I better learn some stuff. And maybe you people might want to know a bit too. As he is a uh, Draguda Six Beards. Let's talk to him. That all tick. Right, never mind. Let's get started here. Greetings, Bert the Bandit. What can you tell me about this land? Kulchorn is one of the seven continents. Firan and Folet, Folwen of the Icy Poles. Kulchorn with its mountains and forests, Moodlan and its heat and desert fields, Wazlan and its rocky slopes, and yellow-green meadows, Anan and its mysterious forests, and Lowan, an unforgiving land of frost. Kulchorn's dominant powers were Ravacane, a confederation of island nations in the White Sea, apart from the mainland and Crimnand. Crimnand fell apart in recent times after the death of High King Mason III, almost a century ago. What was once Crimnand has split into several warring factions, each claiming to be the rightful successor to Crimnand of old. Tell me about these factions. Senegotch is what remains of old Crimeland. Its capital, High Quarry, was the ancestral home of the Mason Kings and the Stormcaller dynasty before them. Calog Chaloglach is a harsh territory ruled by a cruel warlord determined to restore the old laws of Crimeland. Mithmir upon Mamun lies in the shadow of the mountain Mamun, and is ruled by a priest-king of the old religion. His motivation is to reinstate the old gods of the Crimish pantheon, and to do away with the Andrianism as the chief faith of Kulchorn. Calontia Aquilantia is under is united under Ray Joachim, the Golden Eagle. Their claim rests on Joachim's distant blood relation to Hakon V of Amon Amonos, first conqueror of Crimland. Shearstone is a land ruled by the Corrigan people, united under Ishikrator Visarion, they wish to abolish absolute monarchy entirely. Instead, they propose a constitutional monarchy, led by a great leader who collaborates with a citizen's council. Wicked Lands was never part of the Crimish state, but the Brennin Kadwalada marches to conquer Crimland in its weakened state, as Wicked Lands never could in the past. Ravacane has recently declared war on Kulchorn to install Conanger Tyroth as sole ruler of the land. Rumour has it that his son is the Prince of Liquid Gold and is destined to unite Kulchorn once again. Interesting. Anything else? 
There are a few who dispute the claims of these myriad kings and seek to press their claim to the marble hall themselves. They would be found scattered across the land, no doubt sheltering in the hall of a lord at odds with the king whose claim they dispute. So, claimants, I presume. All right. What news have you heard? Uh, no news has reached my ears recently, good sir. Come back tomorrow, I may have more to tell. All right. I want to know something about an important person. About whom do you wish to hear? Conangrua Tyroth, Lysandros of Ravacane. Ah, the sea people of the White Sea each have their own island kings. Ravacane is merely a loose confederation of these territories that united hundreds of years ago to strengthen themselves against encroaching human settlement from continental Kuchorn. In times of war, however, the Council of Sycon will gather to hold a moot and elect a Conanger from the kings of the Five Islands. The Conanger is chosen for his military prowess, chivalry and intelligence, but some historians have noted that wealth plays a large role in the election. Therefore, these Conangers usually hail from one of the two most prosperous White Islands, Avashai and Tharokane. Tyroth Aina Lysandros was the Tharokane Sea Lord before his appointment. <clears throat> Tyroth is famed for his participation in the failed Senegotch annexation of the simmering islands of Mudlan. Ravacane was called upon in the Isle's defence, but Kamat and her allies, the Antiroth's fleet, was the largest in the Ravacane navy. He smashed the Senegotch navy in the blood coral battle and threw the late Terran's brother into the sea to drown. Terran, Carwin, barely escaped with his life, and the invasion was thwarted. It came as no surprise to us when it was Tyroth that was elected by the council to lead a Ravikane assault on the mainland. He is a terrible force, and seeks to conquer Cranland and Kuchorn whole. If the petty kings of this land don't end their squabbling soon and band together to meet this threat, this land is surely doomed. Oh, uh, what about whom do you wish to hear now? Caravan, son of Tyroth. The Aethling Caravan's name was scarce known to us not too long ago outshone by his older brother and crown prince Ixander. He might not, he might as well not have existed, but if it were not for him, his father and brother may well have drowned in the White Sea. When they took a bad engagement with the Senegotch navy at the start of their invasion, Tyroth's scouts had underreported the number of ships defending the shield waters and fell prey to an ambush headed by Erfin Hor and his sons. A terrible miscalculation that nearly cost Ravikane the war effort. Caravan's ships, however, managed to avoid being encircled, and he hatched a brilliant scheme from the bridge of his flagship. Bringing his ships upwind of the Senegotch navy, he sowed the wind with fire salts, which caught Hor's ships and spared his allies' own. The salts blinded the Senegotch that were caught above deck, and allowed his father and brother to pole into a more advantageous position, and re-engage the foe. Outnumbered, the Ravikane won a crushing victory thanks to the Aethling scheme. The boy, hard as iron, came to strike fear 
into the hearts of the Crinish in ways his brother never could. Severe, and without mercy, it is said that Caravur drowns his enemies in the name of the sea-god Manos, wielding uncanny strategic skill and dark magic. He looks to spearhead the Ravicane invasion of Kulchorn, and give his father the crown. His brother may be the Golden Prince, but Caravur is a man of iron, cold and strong. All right. Tell me of the Ravicane Crown, Cri Crown Prince, Ixander. You've likely heard of the Golden Prince of Ravicane before. Since his birth, during the Night of the Red Star, he's been hailed by the Ravicane as the promised Prince of Liquid Gold that will unite Kulchorn under one banner. Growing up, he seemed to live up to the prophecy. A highly skilled swordsman, he proved his skill many a time at tournaments across the White Islands, taking wreaths of winter fruit countless times. Renowned for his dashing beauty and chivalry, he is a demigod to the Ravicane people and the Nicor at large. Pah! A prince of fish, I'd call him. In the first days of the Ravikin invasion, he proved himself to be a much worse commander of men than he was a swordsman, nearly getting his father and himself killed in a naval battle in the shield waters. His brother, Caravur, saved his hide, and the Ravikin war effort, and proved himself to be the stronger of the two. Gold may be pretty to look at, yes, but iron is strong. Unbending. Gold is soft, not fit for war. Interesting. Tell me about uh, Hagen. The second son of a minor noble living near Uxkal. Hagen was educated in the art of war and single combat. After being knighted, he served as a paid knight in the army of Count Delinard and fought against the Vagas before leading a group of outriders that defeated a Kurgut raid near Amir to ensure ca the, count the ensuing counter-raid and the following two campaigns earned him glory and fame as a warrior. So, skilled, all right. Tell me about Conrad. Ah, Conrad is a professional mercenary from the distant land of Balion, far beyond the vast Western Ocean. Having spent most of his years on campaign and seen countless battles, Conrad has grown to love his life as a soldier of fortune. Though he once had his nose flattened by a mace blow and received many wounds, he has nevertheless survived this harsh existence through the strength of his arm innate cunning and pure luck. Hearing of the lucrative career opportunities awaiting a man of his talents in Kulchorn, Conrad chartered a vessel and crossed the sea with his men in search of new wars to fight. Interesting. A mercenary. Seems these people are individuals I'll need to look out for. Tell me about Rodrigo de Braganca. Uh, there is a reason no one goes about the cities without armed guards once the sun sets. And that reason is Rodrigo de Braganca, once a bright-eyed merchant who arrived at Tyr with a small fortune in rubies and a dream to corner the velvet market. He was soon reduced to a pauper having lost everything to cutthroat competition with the colluding Rodok Merchants Guild. But he soon turned measuring scales into swords and applied his considerable business smarts into building up the deadliest criminal enterprise in Veluca. 
with hideouts and operations in every major town. He has attained his goal, for the price on his head is greater than the riches he once pursued. Now he takes great pleasure in relieving his former competitors of their worldly goods and worries. Interesting. A man after my own heart. Tell me about Stravos. Uh, Stravos was born in the independent city-state of Zendar and spent much of his adult life serving in the town watch under the famous constable Harrick. Stravos's leadership and prowess were instrumental in ridding the area of the dreaded river pirates, but even he was powerless against the calamity that befell the city when Zendar was raised to the ground by a great horde of sea raiders. Stravos fled the burning city with a crowd of refugees. After a brief period of wandering and of jobs, he found, him, he found a place in a mercenary company, eventually raising to become its leader due to his dedication and tactical aptitude. He now devotes most of his efforts to working with manhunters and local authorities against the sea raiders and other outlaws, trying to keep the land safe for travellers. Right, order watch out for him. Uh, tell me about Zver. Ah, Zver is one of the so-called sea raiders. Freebooters and lawless men from the icy realm of Yorman, north, beyond the North Sea. Also said to be the ancestral home of the Nords. Already as a young man he has been along on many raids against both his distant cousins in Wurcheg region and the Vegas. However, Sver was always a sharp lad, and it didn't take him long to see that cool chorn was a far more prosperous land than his own, and that he could have a better life here than among his own people. During a raid on Jaik, Zver stole away while his comrades were busy looting the village and taking captives. Passing himself off as a yokel from Chalbeck, from the Chalbeck Mountains, Zver quickly built up a reputation for himself as a fierce fighter and he now seeks his fortune at the head of a Sea Raider band. All right, I'll have to watch out for that one. Tell me about Usiatra. Ah, Usiatra usurped leadership of a group of bandits that occupied Siri, a rural village in the southern deserts outside the realm of Kuchorn. In a curtain bloody fashion, when she was seventeen years old, under her direction, the band of ruffians quickly expanded their operations across the Southlands. Her shrewd and decisive manner, combined with her merciless ambition, which she acts upon with inhuman composure and cruelty, garners fanatic admiration from those that follow her. As such, amongst her own, she lives a decadent, spoilt life built upon the violent plundering she exacts in her travels. Her military strength and natural strategic wit allow her to outfit, allow her outfit to remain undealt with in her homeland. And now she turns her eye towards the rich lands of Kulchorn to sustain her war band. Interesting. I think I'm in love. Uh, tell me about Zara. Being the daughter of one of the most infamous bandit leaders in the Saranid realm isn't always easy, but Zara seems to have managed quite well. Unlike most women, she grew up learning the ways of the desert warrior, and is deadly with the sword as well as the bow. While the other girls her age learned how to manage the household, Zara learned how best to gut a merchant before taking his money. 
At the age of 16, Zara had killed more men than the average veteran in the Sultan's army. Just before her 20th birthday, her father was killed in a brawl with another bandit leader. As the only child, Zara now took control of her father's band. After avenging her father, she quickly picked up where he had left off. Now she's on a good way of establishing her own reputation as a bandit leader. Interesting. Yeah, these are people you need to watch out for, I suppose. Let's take a look at the factions. Kingdom of Calatonia, Kingdom of Caloglaich, Kingdom of Senegoch, Kingdom of Shearstone, Mithmir upon Mamoon, and Wicked Lands. Wicked Lands is ruled by Brennan Anir Kadwalada. Mithmir upon Mamoon is ruled by Volkav Yorath Roiderich. Kingdom of Shearstone ruled by Iskikrata Visarion Senegoch Tirana Ronwin Kadagan. Boy, these are really hard names to pronounce. Kingdom of Galoglaich. Chalaglaich, whatever. Artigeridna Lago Christanan. Oh, bloke. And then there's the Kingdom of Calontia. Aquilancia, ruled by Ray Joachim the Second. Right. Well, I think he's the only one who is mentioned of all those people. <laughs> Others seem to be bandit leaders of some sort, I suppose. Interesting. Perhaps mercenaries, invaders. That will certainly be interesting. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, lore and information about Kulchorn. Anyway, I will see you at another time, in another place. Perhaps with an army at my back. Anyway, see you later.